Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Larry Laterman. I am the coordinator of the uh, CG Global Policy Forum here in Ottawa. First, I would like to recognize the presence of some members of the Diplomatic Corps. Uh, we have with us the Ambassador of Italy, His Excellency Gian Lorenzo Cornado. We have the Ambassador of Sweden, His Excellency Teppo Torianin, and the Ambassador of Kazakhstan, His Excellency Konstantin Zigalov. We also have with us uh, the Chief of Protocol of Parliament, Elizabeth Rohde, and uh, she's here to, be sh to ensure that everyone is behaving themselves. I just thought I'd mention that. And uh, we have members of uh, the embassies of Japan, France, the United States, Spain, uh, Slovak Republic, and Belgium, and Indonesia. Uh, and, of course, members of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development, other departments. And um, we also would like to welcome former Canadian ambassadors, Craig McDonald, who is our ambassador to Finland, uh, Chris Westall, who is our ambassador to Russia and Ukraine, and uh, members of Carleton University and the University of Ottawa. I would like first for Fred Kuntz, the Vice President of Public Affairs, to come to the podium and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, and uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to see such a fine turnout for our uh, uh, address today. I'd say that uh, tonight's keynote speaker really needs uh, no introduction in Ottawa. John Ibbotson is one of the preeminent uh, political writers in Canada, and I'm pleased to say that I've worked with him twice, once at the Globe and Mail, where he was uh, chief political writer, a job from which he's currently on leave for one year. And again, at the present time at CG, where John is a senior fellow heading a research project for CG on Canadian foreign policy. As such, he's the author of a new CG paper uh, just released yesterday. Please be sure to pick up your complimentary copy of The Big Break, The Conservative Transformation of Canada's Foreign Policy. Uh, during his leave from the Globe, John is also working on the definitive biography of Canadian Prime Minister Stephen, uh, Stephen Harper. Uh, to be published by McClellan and Stewart before the federal election expected in late 2015. John has a degree in English from U of T, a master's degree in journalism from Western, and in a career spanning a quarter century, he's been a journalist with the Ottawa Citizen, Southern News, The National Post, and since 1999, The Globe and Mail, where he was also uh, the Queen's Park columnist, the Washington Bureau Chief, and the Ottawa Bureau Chief. Along the way, he's published several books of political analysis. His latest work, which I will give a plug for, John, no charge, uh, co-written with Daryl Bricker is uh, the national bestseller, The Big Shift, The Seismic Change in Canadian Politics, Business and Culture, and What It Means for Our Future. He also writes plays and novels in his book, The Landing Won a Governor General's Award for Children's Literature. That's not to mention the many other honours and nominations for his wide-ranging body of work. A great thinker, writer and journalist, please welcome John Ibbotson. Well, thank you, Fred, and, and, and thank you, Larry. Um, and I would also uh, like to uh, begin with two very large thank yous. Uh, one to the Globe and Mail uh, for giving me this uh, one year leave of absence to study and to write. Uh, it's my first sabbatical, if that's the right word for it, in 22 years. Um, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity. And as well uh, to CG. Um, I have been deeply impressed by the frankly intimidating intelligence of the, um, uh, of the fellows and the directors at the center. Um, and the dedication of its president, uh, Rohinton Medora. CG is only a decade old, um, but it already has a large body of, uh, distinguished body of work. But if you ask me, it's just getting started. You all have access to the paper on which uh, tonight's talk is based. So rather than just repeating everything in it by talking really, really fast, uh, what I'd like to do is give you the essence of what it says. And then let's have at it. Uh, evenings like this, uh, are always most successful if they end in a lively debate. Preferably one, though, that's shy of actual violence. The big break refers to the sharp shift in direction of Canada's foreign policy that followed the election of the Harper government in 2006. What was elitist became populist. What was multilateral became self-assertive. What was cooperative became confrontational. And what was foreign affairs became an extension of domestic affairs. What was, you name it, peacekeeping, foreign aid, collective security, became trade above all else. The big break, or if you prefer, the conservative transformation of Canada's foreign policy, has been heavily criticized 
by academics, former diplomats, politicians, and journalists. It has also had a few defenders. Uh, the paper examines how the big break came about and what it looks like. And it seeks to place this transformation within the context of a foreign policy that was already in flux. And so the paper divides the arc of Canadian foreign policy from the end of the Second World War to today into four sections. Laurentian coherence, Laurentian incoherence, conservative incoherence, conservative coherence. And it begins in, on January 13th, 1947, when Louis Saint Laurent, who was then the external affairs minister to Mackenzie King, delivered the first Gray Lecture at the University of Toronto. In that landmark address, Saint Laurent laid down the priorities that became the foundation of Canada's post-war foreign policy. And the most important principle, really which became the very backbone of our foreign policy, stressed the need for Canada to deeply engage with multilateral institutions. We have a useful part to play in world affairs, he said, useful to ourselves through being useful to others. Saint-Laurent's lecture served as a template for the foreign policy as pursued by the Laurentian consensus. The term is derived, as many of you know, from the uh, book The Big Shift, which uh, Fred mentioned, co-written with Daryl Bricker, published last year. By the way, just came out in paperback, makes a lovely Easter gift. Uh, as many of you know, the book argues that the political, bureaucratic, media, academic, cultural, and business elites in the urban centers within the St. Lawrence River watershed, essentially Toronto and, and Ottawa and Montreal, governed Canada for much of its history. On the great issues of the day, from the national policy, fighting the depression, fighting Quebec separatism, eliminating the deficit, gay marriage, these elites debated among themselves, usually reached a consensus, and implemented that consensus. They ran the country. And although there were fractures from time to time, the conscription crises, the Bullmark Missile Crisis, free trade with the United States, for the most part, both liberal and progressive conservative governments and the Laurentian elites themselves shared the same approach, whether it was the founding of NATO, peacekeeping initiative, fighting apartheid in Africa, responsibility to protect. Canada projected its values to the world through this bipartisan Laurentian consensus. But as the 20th century reached its end, this decades-old approach was starting to fray at the edges, even starting to come apart at the seams, undermined by external shocks and internal erosion. Internally, national social programs such as public health care and other transfers were paid for in part by slashing the defense budget, which went from a high of 8% of GDP in the early 1950s uh, during the Korean War to 0.9% of GDP at the end of the last decade. A smaller military meant less ability to contribute to peacekeeping and other manifestations of the global security agenda, including NATO. External shocks were even more severe. The end of the Cold War eliminated the stability of a bipolar world order. And 9-11 threw what was left of that order into chaos. Canada struggled to respond to acts of terror and the war on terror. The Canada-US border thickened as security concerns trumped economic concerns. We stayed out of Iraq. We went into Afghanistan. We promised to join ballistic missile defense. Then we reneged on that promise. We made aggressive commitments to fight global warming. We failed to live up to any of those commitments. By the time of the 2006 election, Canadian foreign policy was mired in Laurentian incoherence. As Canada preached collective global security, but abandoned the practice of contributing to it, while taking turns at either supporting the United States or bashing it. While all of this was happening, other forces were at work, eroding the very foundations of Laurentian foreign policy consensus. One was the shift in population and wealth and political power to the West, which is traditionally more conservative than in central Canada. It was after our book came out that the statistic uh, was released by StatScan, you know it, that there are more people now living in the four western provinces than in Quebec and Atlantic Canada combined. And the second was the arrival of five million immigrants, two Toronto's worth of immigrants, 
over the course of the last two decades. And these immigrants were very different from those who had come before. Most of them were from China, India, Philippines, other Asian and Pacific nations. And they tended to be more conservative economically and socially than the native born and immigrants from, from Europe. This shift in power to the West and this shift in the nature and patterns of immigration brought the Laurentian consensus to its knees and brought Stephen Harper to power. Now, the priorities of that first shaky minority government were entirely domestic. But the conservatives did have ideas about foreign policy. What they didn't have was any skill in implementing those ideas. And so Canada transitioned from a period of Laurentian incoherence to a period of conservative incoherence. And the paper, when you read it, identifies five different principles that we can draw or we can discern from the conservative foreign policy over the last eight or nine years. Now, it's important to remember that these are principles that I have discerned inside the foreign policy of the conservative government. It's, they are not principles that are enunciated by the government itself. The first principle is by far the most important. And it is conservative foreign policy reflects the values and interests of the conservative coalition. I'm actually going to repeat this one. Conservative foreign policy reflects the values and interests of the conservative coalition. The electoral coalition that sustains the Harper government, as you know, is unlike any coalition that has ever sustained a government before. There has never been a majority government before with no substantial support from the province of Quebec. This is a majority government in which there are as many MPs from the western provinces as there are from Ontario. And look at those Ontario MPs. About a third of them are from rural ridings, and most of the rest are from suburban ridings surrounding Toronto and the other major cities, most of them with very large immigrant populations. These patterns are replicated in a smaller scale in British Columbia. So rural and suburban Ontario, the prairies, rural and suburban British Columbia, aspirational immigrants, suburban middle class, this is the Conservative coalition. The foreign policy of the Conservative government reflects the values of this coalition. And because the coalition that supports the government is very different from any previous coalition that has supported any previous government, the foreign policy of the Harper government is very different from that of other governments. I have to say that for me, this is well duh, kind of obvious. But some people have a very difficult time getting their head around it. That said, at times the conservatives themselves had trouble understanding what it was their supporters wanted. And China is a particularly lamentable example of that. Many of the conservative base, many including uh, many inside the rural uh, conservative caucus, took a very dim view of the Chinese government. And Stephen Harper, as you know, initially agreed. We all remember that famous quote about Canadians didn't want their government, quote, to sell out the almighty dollar, unquote. The government assumed the Canadian businesses could prosper in China even as the Canadian government snubbed the regime in Beijing. And this turned out to be a false assumption. Business leaders began warning that Canada was being frozen out of the market. And word also began filtering up from the shires that many of the new Chinese arrivals, especially those from mainland China, didn't particularly like all of this China bashing. And of course, those voters lived in the, sub the suburban ridings that the Tories most heavily coveted. So Stephen Harper's cold shoulder to China was actually putting his own electoral fortunes at risk. By 2009, the Sino-Canadian relationship was a mess, and Stephen Harper was entirely to blame. A second principle of conservative foreign policy is that the Canadian military shall be a source of pride, not embarrassment. And indeed, spending went up substantially, especially in the early years, to about 1.3% of GDP. And it was about more than just equipping the army in Afghanistan. The Harper government wanted to use the military as a tool for reimagining Canadian history. The reintroduction of the word royal to the Air Force and Navy, the Highway of Heroes, the commemoration of Canada's martial past in the Citizenship Guide, the celebration of the bicentenary of the War of 1812, the emphasis on peacemaking over peacekeeping. All of this sought to dilute the Laurentian lens through which Canadians viewed their past. The Conservatives have long chafed 
that so many Canadian symbols, the national flag, peacekeeping, the welfare state, the CBC, are identified with the Liberal Party because it was Liberal governments that introduced them. The Conservative leadership was anxious to establish new myths, one that Canadians would associate with the Conservative Party and Conservative values. And so a third foreign policy principle is that Canadian foreign policy shall bolster patriotic pride. As we've seen, the military was one vehicle that the Conservatives used to rewrite the national myth, and the Arctic was another. The Canada First Defence Strategy, released in 2008, envisioned a fleet of Arctic patrol vessels, a deep water port at Nana Civic, in support of aggressive Canadian claims over Arctic lands, water, and the seabed. Defending the North would be a Canadian, a conservative myth, and one that all Canadians would proudly embrace. But of course, there are myths, and then there are boots on the ground. Despite the military buildup, the Canadians were barely able to hang on in Kandahar. And plans for the patrol ships were put off and put off again. The Deepwater Harbor at Nana Civic exists only on paper. Pride in the military and a broad sense of patriotic pride were undermined by the quagmire of Afghanistan and the inability to deliver commitments in the North. Patriotic pride began to look like sheer bluster. The Conservatives did work cooperatively with the Arctic Council, but in other forms, especially the United Nations, Canadian commitments waned under the Harper Conservatives, and deliberately so. For a fourth policy principle of the Harper government is that Canada will contribute to multilateral institutions only to the extent that they advance Canada's interests. Now, nothing represents a greater break from the Laurentian worldview than the conservative skepticism towards just being part of the gang. A commitment to such institutions was central to Saint Laurent's approach to external affairs and has been at the heart of conservative foreign, or Canadian foreign policy ever since. But conservatives, both large and small c, see institutions such as the UN, the Commonwealth, the Francophonie, and other talking shops as just that, places that spend too much time jawing and too little time doing. That suspicion, coupled with contradictory directives to the mission in New York and policies towards Africa and the Middle East that undermined uh, potential support, cost Canada a seat at the United Nations Security Council in 2010. Once again, conservative values, or perhaps simple conservative preachiness, conflicted with Canadian interests at great cost. A core domestic conservative priority animates the fifth and final uh, at least for this survey, conservative foreign policy priority. Trade is job one. The conservative agenda is dedicated to protecting workers and consumers as the conservatives understand them. And so the government is very bullish on trade agreements. But this initiative also foundered. On the Canada-US trade front, despite uh, our concessions on softwood lumber, Congress implemented the Buy American uh, protectionist plans and imposed uh, passport requirements. And on the Trans-Pacific Partnership talks, the single most important set of trade negotiations underway on the planet, Canada actually declined to join, intent on protecting the supply management for dairy and poultry. The Harper government changed its mind once the United States decided to, to join in, but by then the word came back to the negotiating table, sorry, too late. So what does it all add, add up to? Five conservative foreign policy principles, each of which has been undermined Conservative foreign policy reflects the values and interests of the conservative coalition, but that led, among other things, to tension and anger in Canada's relations with China. Canada's military shall be a source of pride, not embarrassment, but despite an impressive buildup of personnel and equipment, it became clear that Can Canada was unable to do more than just hang on in Kandahar. Canadian foreign policy shall bolster patriotic pride, but when the Conservatives proved unable to back up their claims in the far north, patriotic pride began to look like simple bluster. Canada will contribute to multilateral institutions only to the extent they advance Canadian interests, but that led to humiliation when Canada tried and failed to win a seat at the Security Council. Trade is job one, unless it involves cows and chickens. If we ended the story there, it would not be much of a story. Conservative incoherence replaces liberal incoherence, uh, Laurentian incoherence, as Canada's standing in the world continues its long decline. But that is not the whole story, far from it. Canada's foreign policy in the second half of the decade has started to show both coherence, even signs of competence. 
The conservatives have adapted their five principles to fit a fluid reality. The government has learned. It has learned to the point where we can now say that we are in a period of conservative coherence as far as foreign policy is concerned. One sure sign of a weak ministry is the rotation of ministers through it. Between 2000 and 2011, I was going to do this as a trivia test, but thought it would take way too long before you got through them all. Foreign Affairs was led by Lloyd Axworthy, John Manley, Bill Graham, Pierre Pettigrew, Peter McKay, Maxime Bernier, David Emerson, Lawrence Cannon, and John Baird. Nine ministers in 11 years. But Mr. Baird appears to have broken the curse. He shares the worldview of the Prime Minister and has his confidence. Mr. Baird appears to be, set to be, the first foreign affairs minister since Joe Clark to arrive at the end of one election and survive to the beginning of the next one in a majority government. Recognizing that he needed to change his approach to China, Mr. Harper traveled to Beijing in 2009. As you know, things went badly when Premier Wen Jiabao publicly humiliated the Prime Minister, telling him it had taken him far too long to visit the Middle Kingdom. But Mr. Harper persevered, and Paul Evans, in his new book, Engaging China, concludes that in many respects, the high policy of engagement was back to where the Martin government had left it in 2005. On the military front, the expeditionary force in Afghanistan transitioned from a combat to a training role, we ended it completely in March 31st. On the Arctic front, although the conservatives have promised more than they've delivered, they have at least partly delivered, especially the, uh, the construction of an all-weather road uh, to the Arctic coast. After early missteps, the government has pursued an intelligent and aggressive trade policy, signing a landmark agreement with the European Union in October, and of course with South Korea last month, the first FTA with the Pacific nation. And Canada, uh, Asian nation. And Canada finally won a seat at the Trans-Pacific Partnership Talks. Signature new trade agreements could be the most important legacy of this government's majority mandate. This multi-pronged uh, outreach on trade is part of a policy of tying trade to development and foreign aid that has evolved over the years of conservative power. It reached its formal expression last autumn when the government released its Global, action, uh, Global Markets Action Plan, GMAP, and in the government's decision to fold CETA back into DFAT-D. By the way, while I've been gone for three months, no one has come up with anything better than DFAT-D, have they, to describe it? Let me know if you do. But of course, the relationship with the United States is the relationship that matters above all. Here, the record has been mixed. Hopes for a continental border security agreement have been partially realized through the Beyond the Border Accord, signed in February 2011. And it looks as though we may actually get the winds of Detroit Bridge, especially if we agree to pay for all of it. But anger on the Canadian side over the uncertainty surrounding Keystone XL has brought things to a point where it may require a new president and or a new prime minister to reset the relationship. Stephen Harper is now one of the longest serving global leaders, at least in a democratic country. And that personal experience on the world stage has led to a more nuanced approach to multilateral institutions. So the government is heavily involved, for example, in programs related and run by the G20, and it remains a strong supporter of what is once again the G7. But as you, we all know, the Prime Minister boycotted the 2013 meeting of Commonwealth heads of government in Sri Lanka over that government's treatment of the Tamil minority. And while the decision has been widely, widely criticized, it is at least consistent with the government's approach to engaging only in those multilateral institutions that it believes are effective and serve Canada's interests. By far the most contentious shift, of course, is in the question of Israel. Critics, and they are many, of the Conservatives' unwavering commitment to that government complain that Canada has thrown away decades of patiently won goodwill among Palestinians and Arab states. Those who know Stephen Harper best and who have known him longest Tell us that this intense interest in and support for Israel emerged when he was a teenager. In fact, it's an, uh, something he inherited from his father, who was a passionate supporter of Israel. And it has never wavered. He has been, term been determined from the first day to reorient Canadian foreign policy in favor of defending and supporting Israel. It is also true that because of this unwavering support, several Canadian ridings with large Jewish populations have switched from the Liberals to the Conservatives. So is the conservative stance on Israel principled policy, or is it partisan pandering? I think the answer is yes. 
One final example of an increasingly sure-footed conservative foreign policy has been Canada's aggressive support for the new government in Ukraine and its condemnation of Russian actions. Again, some see this as pandering to the Ukrainian-Canadian vote at a time when Canada should be quietly attempting to build bridges between Kiev and Moscow. Yet I suspect that it is not only Ukrainian Canadians who support th this government's assertive response to the uh, aspirations of the Ukrainian people for democracy and closer ties to the West. So sum it all up, what do you have? A break, a big break. A new emphasis on trade, a new belligerence in the North, a more robust military, a new patriotism, a new skepticism towards at least some global institutions, a new and unqualified commitment to Israel, most of all, a new determination to make Canada's policy more conservative, small and large C, in word and deed, in order to align that policy to the values and concerns of the Conservative Coalition. It's quite a change. Some people think, and hope, that this break is really only a bump. That after the next election, the Liberals and New Democrats will come to power, alone or in some kind of combination, restoring a more balanced, multilateral, Laurentian approach to Canada in the world. Perhaps. But the West is only going to grow more populous and more politically powerful with each passing year. That's not going to change. The flood of Chinese and Indian and Filipino and other and Asian Pacific immigrants will continue. That's not going to change. Whichever political party wins the next election, or the one after that, or the one after that, must take this reality into account. It must take the West into account. It must take the suburbs into account. It must take the immigrants into account. And if the West and the suburbs and the immigrants actually like this new conservative uh, Canadian foreign policy, then a different government, whatever its political stripe, will have to take that into account as well. In which case, the big break will no longer be seen as a break at all. We'll have a new term for it. We'll call it bipartisan. Thank you. John, I understand the coherence argument when it comes to looking at the conservative coalition and linking it back to trade. That makes all sorts of sense to me. I have more trouble seeing a conservative uh, coalition being interested in uh, the North, the military, or indeed Israel. And even if you don't just say it's what the conservative coalition is interested in, the whole notion of a coherent conservative policy, I'm having a little trouble fitting all of those together other than the trade one. I think it, that, again, it, it is a process of evolution, but let's take the North. We know that previous to the arrival of the Harper government, uh, governments, both progressive, conservative, and liberal, had a, had a consistent approach to the North, claim everything, do nothing. Um, and that was always our, it's all ours, and uh, with the exception of Diefenbaker. But there's a whole other essay to be written on Diefenbaker as a, as a proto Stephen Harper. But let's not, uh, let's not go there. Um, so in, the, in asserting, you know, the, the claims of Canada in the North, in, in extending those claims, frankly, against the, uh, the advice of, of their own scientists, in, to the extent they have invested in infrastructure, um, in making uh, it's the, the one thing the Prime Minister does every year, his, his trip to the North, they're tapping into, its, it, and it's almost a boy's own uh, quality, a romantic notion that this is our North, we're a cold country, we're all about winter, it belongs to us, and by God, we're going to defend it. Um, in fact, we're not really doing a very good job of defending it. But the rhetoric, at least, uh, is consistent. And, and, and quite a difference from previous governments, which essentially just tried to keep the, the issue in a box. And I think you can, you can apply that as well, um, whether it's in the case of, of romanticizing the military, uh, doing things as well to, 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 uh, to, to, to bolster it, um, although you know, they're, they're facing cuts as well. Um, and there's the new defense strategy coming out uh, probably later this year. But on, on any one of these files, I think you can say that at least rhetorically, and to some extent increasingly with substance, they are changing the narrative. 
John, um, I'm another John. I, uh, I certainly sympathize with your basic point that the government is learning. Um, it takes a long time for an opposition party, especially for an opposition party that's been in opposition for a long time, to, uh, to learn. And to some extent, I'm sensing around the edge more that it's becoming part of the mainstream which you call a conservative coalition or a conservative consensus than, uh, than a break. It's just partly the learning process of any government in office for a period of time. What I'm wondering, though, is I wonder if you and Daryl, both in the original book and also in, in the piece which I have not read that you're speaking about, are, under, are, are in a sense confusing urbanism with the West. I, myself, am from the West. If you look at Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, and uh, Toronto, Montreal, surely that's where the ultimate interests of the country are, both in economic terms, social terms, cultural terms. That's where all the action ultimately is. So surely the Canadian interests, as you've defined them, conservative values or call them what they will, is basically an urban issue, uh, which in fact the government over time is going to have to accept, or it will find that the uh, thrust of the shift of dem demographics to the cities will in fact make them look entirely irrelevant and therefore have great difficulty in being reelected either in 2015 or further down the road. It's a very astute point. And by the way, in the, um, the introduction to the paperback edition, uh, we try to clarify one uh, idea that uh, perhaps we didn't do as good a job of as we should. We are not saying that the Conservatives will win every election. Uh, this government is seeking a fourth mandate, something that hasn't been achieved since Laurier. Um, it's got the Senate expenses scandal, uh, and you know it could lose the next election. What we're saying is that there is a coherence to the conservative coalition um, that exists today, um, that existed for the liberal coalition in the last century. Conservative governments came to power, but they always made no sense, right? I mean, French nationalists and Westerners, what are they doing in the same caucus, right? Um, the progressives have much the same problem. And the essential answer to your, to, to your question is, I believe that those who talk about Canada's urban future don't understand that we don't have an urban future. We have a suburban future. 67% of Canadians live in suburbs. And people, uh, and many of them, I have to say, Laurentians, uh, Laurentian people, who live in the, the, the city neighbor, you know, the Glebe, um, uh, uh, New Edinburgh, uh, um, and I'm, I, I would proudly say even uh, Westboro, which I moved into a few years ago, um, don't understand that it's not a rural-urban split. It's a inner-urban, suburban split, and that the problem with the progressive uh, parties is that they don't necessarily understand the values and concerns of those suburban voters, be it in Toronto or in Calgary. Now, I think Justin Trudeau recognizes this. I was proud to hear um, him described not, not too long ago as the first post-Laurentian liberal leader. Uh, he go goes on at great lengths about the middle class, and um, while not necessarily defining it, I think he recognizes that the liberal party can no longer count on taking the downtowns and then convincing the suburbs that they must vote in solidarity with the downtowns. That the conservatives have convinced the suburbs that they are, it is better off, they are better off voting in solidarity with the rural and that it has to be flipped back. And the, and the only way the progressives can do that is to flip it back. The, and the other problem, since we're going back to the big shift now, of course, is, and this doesn't apply to this paper, is the question of Quebec. It is very hard to make an argument um, it may have just changed a bit, frankly, after last night. But it is very hard to make an argument to Quebec voters who are looking for additional support, social, economic, uh, whatever they can get, frankly, from the federal government, and square those arguments again with suburban voters in the 905 or the Lower Mainland who don't necessarily want their hard-earned money to be sent in transfers east. So that's what we, what we mean when we talk about the incoherence. Let's not talk about urban-rural. Let's talk about urban-suburban-rural, bearing in mind that suburban is not just primus into Paris. It's where two-thirds of the country now is I. I know I'm supposed to thank you, John, but I won't do it just yet. Um, uh, one of the things that's quite striking about the current debates about Canadian foreign policy 
is, um, is the degree to which um, uh, it's politicized, it's carried in papers like the one which you write for, um, and it's not just you writing about those debates. Um, and what is also quite striking is the degree of engagement of former uh, ambassadors, members of the diplomatic corps, who uh, are deeply critical of the current government. When one looks back even at the Axworthy era where there was quite a bit of criticism of some of the initiatives that the then liberal government uh, was embarked upon, um, there was some criticism, but it was largely at the margins. And um, some would say that the consensus is, is breaking down. But how do you explain the degree of polarization with, as you characterize it, the big, the big break? Some would say uh, there's a lot of broken crockery as well. <laughs> and that's got uh, many of the critics up in arms. Uh, brilliant question, by the way. Ben, which is great. <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, it, but it is a good question. I've noticed it before. There has always been, and I think in part uh, it is a Laurentian issue, a suggestion that conservative governments aren't legitimate. I, you know, the, the opprobrium, and you know, I, I put Brian Mulroney down as a very Laurentian prime minister. What was more Laurentian? Uh, than, than the Mulroney government, and yet it was loathed. Uh, Lion Bryan, he was attacked in a way I had never seen a prime minister attacked before. Um, I covered Mike Harris, the golf pro from North Bay. People couldn't utter the words Mike Harris without spitting out that golf pro from North Bay. He wasn't just you know, a conservative premier, he was somehow, he was destroying the province, he was illegitimate. And there it tends to the Harper government as well, on domestic as well, and, and increasingly now in foreign policy as well. I think a suggestion that the government is not legitimate. Conservative governments, if they go too far outside what the, what the Laurentian boundaries maintain a government must be, become rogue governments. And of course, what makes the, the, the frustration about the Harper government so enormous is it keeps winning elections. Um, maybe not the fourth one, but it is one three, which is not a bad run. Um, I think, and again, this is, the, this is the big shift argument, what we're seeing is the conservative ability to tap into the zeitgeist of suburban Ontario, suburban British Columbia, Calgary, uh, Saskatoon and Regina for that matter, and read the values of these people and re represent the values of these people. And they are, um, in some measure, contradictory to the values of those uh, living in, say, downtown Toronto or Ottawa or Montreal. And so there is, I guess the short and simple answer is, as power slips, anger grows. And it just doesn't become, I disagree with the policies of the current government. It becomes, who do they think they are? <laughs> are you aware of any uh, survey research or any kind of research uh, done on the sort of royal branding, uh, because it seems to me that uh, uh, I'm not aware of any demands other than one very small fringe group called the monarchist uh, group or whatever, where there's been any real sort of demand for this rebranding re royal. I mean, I think that any of the military who wanted that you know, sort of finished their service in Korea or Second, or Second World War, uh, no evidence that it came up th from the ranks. And it also seems to me contraindicative vis-a-vis -vis the immigrant population for whom Elizabeth II means nothing. Um, uh, I, it's, a good, it's a very good point, Hugh. Um, I'm certainly am aware of no, uh, no such studies. It could be construed to fit into the larger narrative of promoting the military, restoring pride in it, connecting it to its, to its past. 
It might also just be uh, Stephen Harper uh, paying tribute to his dad. Uh, Joseph Harper was an avid collector of military insignia, um, passionate uh, about the military. He wrote a monograph on a regimental insignia, um, which, by the way, is, is still available. Um, and uh, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me if at the root of all of this, somebody said, well, you know, it's going to look good uh, anyway because it promotes the military and makes, makes people prouder. Uh, it might be good for morale. And, and, and Farper says, said to himself, and wouldn't dad love it? Go ahead. That would be my hunch. John, I'm Chris Westall. Uh, ambassador. And uh, I, I'm a former ambassador, and I have been critical of the foreign policy of this government for years. Uh, I've been a bit of a hedgehog. I've focused on, uh, uh, on Eurasian security policy, particularly above all the expansion of NATO. And I've been uh, quite critical of our stubborn insistence that NATO uh, move further east, uh, including uh, not only Ukraine but Georgia, particularly at a time when Ukrainians uh, don't favor uh, our joining NATO. Uh, I, just a few remarks you made, I, I don't think it uh, uh, has anything to do with, with civil servants or former civil servants like me not thinking, or the Laurentian consensus, not thinking that conservative governments are legitimate. I proudly worked and, and comfortably for a conservative government uh, for many years. You also said that you didn't think that the government had gone beyond the G8 or beyond the United States. The government has gone beyond the G8 and the United States. It's gone beyond the United States and most of the Western world in the Middle East. Uh, it has uniquely, uh, among world leaders, rationalized an attack on Iran by deeming a uh, nuclear Tehran undeterrable. No one else has gone there. We have also undermined uh, uh, the Resolution 242 in the Middle East. Uh, we've gone further than the G7 went in insisting I think, vainly, uh, that uh, uh, Russia completely reverse its actions in Crimea and remove itself from Crimea, which it's not going to do, and the G7 uh, uh, conceded as much. We were beyond the, uh, the G7 there. We have had the most bellicose rhetoric in the Western world, not only in the Middle East, but also in Eurasia. So I think that's, uh, that needs to be uh, said, and I don't know that Canadians do recognize that we do have the most bellicose uh, uh, rhetoric, and it is not consistent with the preparations that we've made to be bellicose. Uh, so that's point one. Point two, with respect to diasporas, uh, the Globe and Mail's quoted me regularly as saying that we have a diaspora-driven foreign policy. It's in the paper, by the way. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Uh, well, I did say that some months ago, and I think diasporas are a huge problem in foreign policy. I just note in passing that one of the biggest problems Ukraine is having right now is that they have the largest Russian diaspora in the world, and that Russian diaspora will not let go of its links with the homeland, which is a problem with diasporas everywhere. And, and it is the responsibility of leaders and foreign ministers to transcend the old views of diasporas and the world views that they bring with them in forming a national policy. And I don't think that that job has been done by our foreign ministers and our leaders lately. Uh, I do not think, I think you're right in the Middle East that uh, we, we do not have a diaspora-driven foreign policy in the Middle East. I think those convictions stem from where you, where you cited their source. But when I made that comment, and it was months ago, it was not in connection with this current Ukrainian crisis, and I, I do not think that passion about what's going on in Ukraine is confined in any way to the Ukrainian diaspora. It includes me, and it includes millions uh, of Canadians. But when I made that remark, I referred specifically to our relations with India and the importance of the Sikh uh, community in our relations with India, uh, the Sikh community being a large part of our Indian community, being a small part of India. I referred to the Tamil community and its uh, influence on our relations uh, with Sri Lanka. And I also referred to the Ukrainian and also some other communities, but let me focus on the Ukrainian community, and uh, uh, observed that it had led to this stubborn insistence, even beyond the Ukrainians, uh, uh, particularly those in the East, on the expansion of NATO, which Russia finds simply neuralgic and always will and, and must. I also referred to the fact that in, in 2010, when our Prime Minister visited Ukraine, he went out of his way to uh, exaggerate, in fact, triple 
the number of estimated victims of the Holodomir. Uh, at the last election, we sent 500 observers uh, to the election in Ukraine. The Poles next door, with much more at stake, sent 200. We have now announced we're going to send 500 for the next election. I don't think those uh, things would be happening had we not uh, a Ukrainian diaspora. Do you? Um, that's a, uh, well, first of all, thank you for that elegant rebuttal. Um, I'll make two brief comments, um, and then let's all have a drink. Um, the first is I think that on, on most of the issues that you cite, um, as you say, the, the, this government has gone farther in a direction that others have gone uh, with more caution. So it is bellicose, yes, but it's bellicose in support of the, the same line of reasoning as, as other countries. Um, maybe that's a luxury that we get to have because we don't actually have the kind of uh, geopolitical stake in the, in the game that some others do. As for the question of a diaspora-driven foreign policy, there I think you and I are going to simply have to fundamentally disagree. Canada is unique in the world. Uh, there is no other country on this planet that brings in as many people as we do and that bring in as many people from as many different places as we do. The great curse of immigration in so many other countries is that it is regionally defined, Latin America in the United States, North Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. But the point system, which I think might have been the greatest achievement of Lester Pearson, ensures that we bring people in from everywhere. And the, and the integration of these people, uh, these immigrants, is more successful here than it is anywhere else on earth. So, you know, multiculturalism actually works. It is a tremendous achievement. It has made Toronto, with half of its population foreign-born, one of the most fascinating and successful cities on the planet. We are going to have to take that into account when forming all policies, domestic and foreign. It is simply not on uh, in a country that it brings in 250,000 people a year, 125,000 of them every year uh, from China and India and the Philippines, to not take into account the interests and the values and the demands of the people from China and India and the Philippines in regional geopolitical consideration. Um, it, that's just not going to happen. It's not politically feasible. It's not politically possible. No politician who ignored the diasporas would win the next election. And you have to have a foreign policy that at the end of the day uh, has continuity if only insofar as the government can get reelected by continuing to have that foreign policy. Anything else is ultimately uh, elitist um, and does not reflect the reality uh, of the country on the ground. But are you not agreeing that uh, it's a diaspora-driven foreign policy? You're saying there's no choice. I'm saying that the government acts on behalf of the interests and the values of the conservative coalition, and that conservative coalition consists in part of aspirational immigrants living in suburbs. Yes, it does, and yes it, it, yes, it always will. And you know what? So will every other government that follows it, because no government is ever going to get elected in this country without taking those values and those interests into account. My task is a simple one, and it's to thank uh, John for uh, provoking us, um, raising uh, some very tough questions, which he does with grace, good humor, uh, elegance, um, he is, uh, without doubt, uh, one of Canada's most uh, distinguished journalists, and it's certainly been uh, a pleasure and privilege, John, to have uh, debated with you on earlier drafts of your paper, um, uh, along with, uh, along with uh, some, of, uh, some, some of my colleagues. Uh, I do think you've put your uh, finger on... Uh, what drives uh, the pulse of uh, Canadian foreign policy. And I'm certainly struck by the fact that you're in good company because John English, a number of years ago, uh, a great liberal uh, uh, and a great historian, in a chapter he wrote for Canada Among Nations, uh, which is uh, 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 an annual review of Canadian foreign policy, uh, said very much uh, the same things that you're saying, that when he was uh, trundling around his uh, riding of Kitchener-Waterloo, um, uh, ethnic uh, uh, diaspora issues were very much at the forefront of uh, the foreign policy concerns of his constituents. 
and um, he uh, is somebody who runs in, as, as we all know, uh, in a very different uh, tribal direction. Um, Nora Ephraim uh, once said that uh, a, a journalist uh, is, uh, is typically a, a wallflower at an orgy, uh, but she went on to say that uh, some journalists do become the life of the party. Uh, John, I think it's fair to say that uh, you are certainly uh, uh, no wallflower in the uh, political orgy uh, on, uh, that takes place uh, when we debate about uh, Canadian foreign policy. Uh, your, your contributions, uh, though, uh, go well beyond journalism. I mean, I think your, your, your work, uh, it's, it's well informed by an understanding of, uh, of uh, the scholarly literature. Uh, it's well informed by, uh, by polling. And um, all I can say is we look forward to your tome on, uh, on uh, Stephen Harper, uh, 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 whether, it's a, whether it's a tombstone or, uh, or a shall we say, a, a, a chapter uh, that, uh, that will uh, uh, be a new chapter uh, going forward. So uh, thank you very much for your comments.